Okay, uh, I think we should start. Um, so it's a pleasure to introduce the final um, speakers, uh, or the panel speakers, not the final speakers. Fergal's still speaking, <laughs> others, but um, um, the final uh, panel of the conference, which is on um, the human body, um, biology, neuroscience, medicine, um, disease, disability, sexuality, and identity. Um, the first speaker on this panel is Emily Chester. She is currently completing her PhD at the University of Bristol. She is very close to submitting now, I know. I am her supervisor. <laughs> um, and she has published, in, published um, <coughs> essays on her work in um, Samuel Beckett Today, Aujourd'hui. Um, she has published a review uh, article in the Journal of Beckett Studies and has two other publications forthcoming in books. Um, her thesis is on the relevance of obsessive compulsive form in Beckett's work. And she's going to be talking today about um, phenomenological performance, navigating the border between dramatic and lived experience in Jess Tom's production of Not I. Thank, Thank you. Today I'd like to share some thoughts about Jess Tom's recent production and performance of Samuel Beckett's play, Not I. In this play, the audience traditionally views the illuminated mouth of the actor as the character of mouth undergoes a verbal explosion witnessed only by the silent auditor. Jess Tom is a performer who identifies as having Tourette syndrome, which is a neurological condition characterized by tics, which are repetitive, involuntary movements or vocalization. Subsequently, in her performance of Not I, her own tics intermingle with the compulsive language of the text itself. I believe that Tom's production speaks directly to the theme of this transdisciplinary conference. Tom is an ardent supporter of promoting increased awareness of disability studies and new perspectives on disabled performers. In July of this year, I interviewed Tom about her ident identification with Not I. And before discussing this further, I'd like to also acknowledge the excellent work of Hannah Simpson, who's not at this conference, but who also spoke with Jess Tom and wrote an article about her for the Beckett Circle in 2017, and whose article inspired me to delve further into the phenomenological specifics of this particular production. It's my strong belief that Tom's insights into the play can help us to frame and refine the key questions of future discourses about the intersection of Beckett studies and disability studies. Key to this belief is Tom's focus on the play's phenomenological proximity to her own experience. During our interview, she said, I was blown away by how many of the lines really resonated with me and my lived experience of Tourette's, so much so that they made me laugh out loud with recognition. Moreover, of the character she plays, Mouth, Tom stated, for me, this is clearly someone whose brain and body work in a non-normative way, and I think it would be fair to say that she is a neurodiverse character and to say that she is definitely a disabled character. I will now draw on these and further remarks from Tom to consider four key implications for how we might think about the future of Beckett studies in conjunction with disability studies. My paper today will consist of four short sections and a quick note that throughout I've represented any verbal tics in brackets when reproducing Tom's quotations. Before I, discuss my, uh, before I begin my discussion, I'd like to show you a short video clip of part of Tom's performance of Not I at the 2017 Edinburgh Festival. Out into this world, this world, tiny little thing, before it's time, in a god for what? Girl, yes, tiny little girl, into this, out into this, before her time, godforsaken hole, called, called, biscuit, no matter, parents unknown, unheard of, he, having vanished, thin air, no sooner buttoned up his breeches, she, similarly, eight months later, almost to the tick. The show, biscuit, we The first aspect of Tom's production I want to consider is the interest it demonstrates 
in restructuring attitudes towards disabled and neurodiverse individuals. When I interviewed Tom, she was adamant that she did not view herself as a sufferer of Tourette's. And in line with this is the picture on the next slide, which shows Tom in another of her performative capacities, Tourette's hero, which puts a decidedly positive spin on Tourette's. She said, obviously, there are some things about living with Tourette's that are challenging. Lots of things are actually nothing to do with my body or my brain, but are about other people's responses to that, assumptions or judgments or lack of thought. So it's not actually me who suffers with Tourette's, but I do suffer with a lot of ableist attitudes. As my interview with Tom progressed, it became more and more evident that her decision to take on the role of mouth was not primarily because it causes her some form of relief from the perceived difficulties associated with Tourette's, but rather because it provides relief for her in its movement away from ableist attitudes towards disability. Indeed, this also fed into Tom's views on the text's debunking of stereotypes about Tourette's. During our interview, Tom discussed several quotations from the play, some of which are also discussed in Hannah Simpson's interview, which perhaps points to the impact that these particular parts of the text made on Tom. Tom reacted to them on a personal level and saw them as offering new understandings of the experience of being disabled or neurodiverse. The first example is when Mouth describes her experience of suffering, or rather not suffering. And this relates back to Tom's assertion that she does not view herself as a sufferer of Tourette's. In the play's text, Beckett writes, as she suddenly realized, gradually realized, she was meant to be suffering, ha, huh, thought to be suffering. Tom comments on this quotation saying that often, not I, is thought of as a very dark and depressing play. For me, actually, it's like we are joining this character who has experienced loads of barriers because she doesn't fit in or conform. So she's had all these barriers, but we're joining her at a point in her life where she seems to be saying that she's suffering less than she ever has done before. Here, Tom's reading of Mouth depicts the character anticipating those expectations from society around her, the normative assumption that, because of her condition, she almost ought to be suffering, and then going on to counter them. Certainly, Mouth herself seems almost to deride such assumptions in her repeated use of the dismissive word, ha, the second example to which Tom alludes is that of Mouth's experience whilst shopping. In the text, Beckett writes, practically speechless all her days, how she survived, even shopping, out shopping, busy shopping center, supermart, just hand in the list, with the bag, old black shopping bag, then stand there waiting, any length of time, middle of the throng, motionless, staring into space, Mouth half open as usual, till it was back in her hand, the bag back in her hand, then pay and go, not as much as goodbye. How she survived. Again, here, Tom does not interpret this experience negatively, but instead sees traditional readings of Mouth's struggle as assumptions about the negativity of the experience of being disabled or neurodiverse. In fact, Tom herself reads this incident differently. She says, Sometimes people will point to the scene about where she goes shopping and be like, she doesn't even speak to anyone when she's doing her shopping. It's almost like, look how weird that is, using supermarkets as a normative space. And I think that's funny in relation to how supermarkets or shops are used within documentaries about disability and particularly about Tourette's as normative spaces. There are no documentaries about Tourette's that I've been able to identify where they don't have the gratuitous shot of someone shouting in the supermarket. But it's interesting because Beckett is using the shop in a similar way, and people will point to that maybe and say, oh, look how isolated she is. I read that scene and was like, someone is doing her shopping for her. She's giving them a list and filling up the bag, paying on going. She has a system that works for her, 
And just because it doesn't look the same as other people's systems or the normative way of doing it doesn't make it less valid. In this second quotation, then, there is again the possible reading of not I displacing stereotypes, which, when apprehended by someone who identifies as disabled or neurodiverse, brings a broadened sense of representation and with it a subsequent relief through that more nuanced artistic vision. Nevertheless, I would contest that it's also important for us to acknowledge that Tom's experience of Tourette's is exactly that, one particular experience of a neurological disorder. The following video, for example, demonstrates other first-person experiences of Tourette's um, from children who do allude to the existence of suffering associated with their tics. I have to like do that with your knees always and it makes me nervous when I have to do like bang my knees together because I always get bruises from doing that I used to bang my head back like like that mm -hmm. and, and it really hurt do you ever try and hold back your tics yes what happens when you try and hold them back weird like you feel when there's an urge to do it like, whatever it is, it's in your stomach, then you do this, and if it's in your head, you do that, and it's really annoying. My best friend constantly when he sees me doing this. In light of these differing accounts of the presence of suffering, perhaps a key lesson for us is that we should not make any assumptions about other people's experience. Such assumptions might especially be borne out through our language. For instance, at the beginning of my interview with Tom, I myself used the term suffering in conjunction with Tourette's without realizing quite how laden with presumption this term was. And I think sometimes as academics, it's easy for us to fall into the trap of believing that we're automatically careful with language. Through talking to Tom, I realized that particularly in respect of disability studies, this is not always the case. The second key issue raised in our interview was the way in which Not I stimulated questions about cultural spaces and disability. Tom told me early on in the interview that part of the motivation for the show was to draw attention to those sort of invisible barriers that exist in our world in some of our cultural spaces. Certainly, Tom's performance at the Battersea Arts Centre this year in London was markedly different from any other performance of Not I that I've ever witnessed or read about. As most of us are aware, the vast majority of productions strictly adhere to Beckett's directorial instructions, and it's notoriously difficult for strong deviations from these instructions to make it past the Beckett estate. Tom, however, told me that she received a great deal of support from both the estate and Beckett academics in her staging of the play which differed in a number of ways from more traditional performances. The requirements for complete darkness were relaxed. Tom performed in her wheelchair, as opposed to being strapped into an elevated device, as is the norm in most productions. Her whole body was visible. There was a British Sign Language interpreter throughout the performance. And Tom made it clear from the start that this was a relaxed space in which those members of the audience with tics should feel at ease with their movements and vocalization. In all of this, there seems to be a pronounced irony that until Tom's production, this play, seemingly about a neurodiverse woman who has experienced judgment and prejudice at the hands of society, could not be comfortably viewed in the theater by certain disabled people who might identify with her experience the most. For instance, Tom suggested that she had herself experienced anxiety at the prospect of being asked to leave a theater because of her tics. In this regard, we might characterize Tom's performance as bringing forth a collective form of relief and acceptance in that her production facilitates the acknowledgement and recognition of the challenges faced by disabled people due to societal attitudes. For Tom, therefore, in the performance of the story of a disabled or neurodiverse character by a disabled performer, there's a recognition, an affirmation of bodily or mental difference, 
in a way that does not thereby make value judgments about such difference. As Tom says, I do understand Martha dis as a disabled character, but within that, I understand that she is only as isolated as her community makes her. We have a choice about whether we want to live in a world where people are being isolated or excluded, or whether we all take responsibility for creating a different sort of world. The third aspect of the interview I want to discuss is Tom's thoughts on the experience of actually performing, not I. Of particular interest is the intersection of Tom's own tics with the already compulsive texture of the play itself. Prior to Tom's performance, the theoretic nature of Beckett's writing has been critically alluded to and discussed by Beckett scholars, and particularly by Ulrika Maud. When I spoke to Tom about the experience of being in the moment of performing Not I, what she told me shattered many of the assumptions about how difficult this play is to perform. I'm sure most of us here are familiar with accounts from other actors who have performed the play. For instance, Billy Whitelaw stated that the very first time she did it, she went to pieces. And more recently, Lisa Duan said that the role of mouth nearly broke her. I'd assumed that Tom would perhaps have doubly experienced the notorious difficulty associated with performing the play in that remembering and uttering the compulsive and staccato monologue of the text would be more difficult when interrupted by Tom's own verbal tics. Instead, Tom refuted these expectations. She said to me, there's no part of my brain or no part of my conscious brain that has to pay attention to the ticks that I'm saying. None of the ticks are existent in a space I would identify as conscious thought. So for Tom, her verbal ticks are not experienced as an aspect of her reflective thought process. Perhaps even more interesting than this was what she said next. What's interesting about the experience of not I is because it has to be delivered with that speed, pretty much the speed of thought, that it needs to occupy quite a similar part of the brain. It needs to start occupying that automatic space. So I'm not consciously thinking about the text. I was interested as to whether I was actually at a neurological advantage as a performer because I have experience of automatic speech. In this way, then, Tom proposed a way in which neurodiversity transcends the stereotype of its association with restriction. Although Tom told me that her motor tics did increase during the performance, her thoughts on her vocal tics correlate with recent psychiatric re research into neurodiversity. For example, Thomas Armstrong argues that people diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder appear to have strengths related to working with systems. People with dyslexia have been found to possess global visual spatial abilities, including the capacity to identify impossible objects, uh, which is shown on this side here. And researchers have observed that subjects with ADHD and bipolar disorder display greater levels of novelty seeking and creativity than matched controls. Armstrong goes on to conclude that such strengths may suggest an evolutionary explanation for why these disorders are still in the gene pool. In line with this research then, delving into the phenomenology of Tom's experience of performing helps us to see how Beckett's writing also fits alongside new psychiatric models that display the practical benefits of neurodiversity. Finally, I want to consider some questions raised by my conversation with Tom namely those relating to the future of transdisciplinary Beckett studies, especially in connection with disability studies. During our conversation, Tom spoke a great deal about the importance of disabled actors playing disabled parts in drama. For Tom, non-disabled actors taking disabled parts is particularly problematic because disabled actors don't have equality of opportunity. She referenced the example of a BBC TV drama she'd watched recently called Undercover, in which she'd checked her own perceptions of equal opportunities for disabled actors. Tom explained how the show contained a character who was a black, learning, disabled man. The actor who was playing this character was a black actor, but he was not learning disabled. 
Tom stated that at first she thought it would have been really hard as a young black actor to say no to that role and to not take that role. She then told me that later, having thought further about this, she changed her mind, realizing that there's no roles ever for young black learning disabled actors. I was thinking maybe it's okay. And then I was like, no, because actually, if you look at the intersection of learning disability and race in that example, then this is probably one of the only parts that would have come up like that. And that's because of what we're writing. It's because of who had power. It's because of assumptions about who the audience is. In line with this, when talking specifically about Not I, Tom stated that it's frustrating when stories around disability are written by non-disabled people and are then performed by non-disabled people. I noticed something of a disconnect here with the fact that she felt this way, but had connected so viscerally with a play written by a white middle-class man in 1972. Uh, did, did this matter? Is Beckett, because he's often regarded as ethically sound, exempt from this criticism? Was Beckett, in fact, just ahead of his time and therefore an exception or an anomaly to Tom's normative recommendations? Fully conceding these arguments uh, not only smacks of reductive virtue ethics, but it also leaves us with the fact that Beckett, a non-disabled man, wrote the story of a seemingly disabled or neurodiverse woman and a story which has been specifically selected by a disabled actor because of its phenomenological accuracy. I pressed Tom on how this fitted into her ethical model of disability and performance. She responded by citing Beckett's strong interest in matters of health and illness, as we are all aware is testified by his copious notes on psychology and other spheres of medicine. She also told me, it's not that I don't think people should ever write these stories because I absolutely think good writers should write varied characters and they should be writing characters that include disabled people, but they should not be writing stereotyped characters. And the issue with stereotypes is that they are able to get by and they go by without being challenged in spaces where people aren't present. While this went some way to introducing a measure of when or how it's acceptable for non-disabled writers and actors to write and act the parts of disabled people, I couldn't help but feel that the lines were still hazy when delineating the point at which a representation becomes a stereotype and when stipulating who gets to decide what constitutes that stereotype in the first place. Tom's choice of Beckett in this, context, in this context did seem somewhat anomalous to the political views she expounded during the majority of our interview, which perhaps just serves to demonstrate the way in which matters of aesthetics cannot be molded simply into ethical precepts. I hope that my discussion of Jess Tom's fascinating and thought-provoking performance of Not I has gone some way towards drawing out the ways in which Beckett's writing speaks directly to important discourses in the field of contemporary disability studies. It's my hope that this is only the beginning of more conversation and collaboration between Beckett scholars and disabled and neurodiverse actors who choose to perform his work. Thank you. In an essay on gender in Beckett's dramas, Shari Blentstock wonders how some of Beckett's characters that were never assigned male or female genders came into being. She asks, were they produced by some extra sexual force? For Benstock, if a body is not gendered, it cannot take part in the sexual. Contrastingly, in Beckett's work, gender is shown to have little bearing on a character's ability to exercise sexuality, instead representing a significance that both folds in on itself and navigates impossible spaces. Indeed, the sexualities made possible by both the avoidance and ironic reification of gender 
suggest a deconstruction of an essentialist definition, in particular, one that would equate gender with specific genitalia. Beckett's minimalist aesthetic is unable to exist alongside such an assumption. Extrasexual to Benstock, in the late prose, gender-fluid beings persist in concupiscence through gender. Beckett studies recalcitrance to queer theory might explain the critical erasure of sexuality in the late prose. Alternative hermeneutic maneuvers and an understanding of gender, an alternative understanding of gender, become necessary to unpick the queer sexualities that reveal themselves. As Mary Bryden suggests of years, there is not just a slow, but a persistent hacking away at the notion of gender as predictor of an array of essentialist components and also a renewed commitment to a, the dynamic of dispossession. This queer dispossession uses geometry to elaborate on the unstable embodiment that we are presented with. What is often perceived as authentically or essentially sexual is interrogated in Beckett. This is a way in which queer time and by extension embodiment can be read into the text. As Elizabeth Freeman suggests, queer time would refuse to write the lost object into the present, but try to encounter it already in the present by encountering the present itself as hybrid. Thus, what Benstock refers to as extrasexual could perhaps be this simultaneous absence and excess, an encounter with hybridity orchestrated by a refusal of temporal linea li linearity. The refusal to draw a clear line between Emma and Emmo, female and male characters, forces this hybridity into sexuality, focusing on the motion of sexual intercourse outside of gender. This is then returned to as a diaphanous attribute of body parts that are traditionally not relied upon for the signification of gender, such as the hands. Before addressing the minimized hybrid gendering through genitalia and imbuing of hands with gendered significance in all strange way, I will first examine the minimizing drives in Beckett that undergird these moves by affecting relationality itself, making a different relationality possible. Hermeneutics in all strange way is forced through an enjambement of conjured imaginings. There is an imbrication of first, second, and third person, and at the beginning of the text, we find a character talking to himself in the last person. This implies a deep division of the self, talking about oneself as if one was not entirely oneself to oneself. This strange multiplying is indicative of the nature of relationality in the text. In attempting to reduce the number of perspectives by reducing the speaker to one, there is a counterintuitive increase or extension, whereby reduction to one is never possible. This changes the way that difference itself can be perceived. The narrator's repeated diagramming and obsession with position, length, fit, and the tendency to designate letters to sections of the space, which function as a mathematical code rather than a description of landscape, creates a stoic embodiment, which is worth quoting at length to observe the effect of this style. She might be, mathematically speaking, more than seven foot long, and merely a question of refolding in such a way that if head on left cheek at new A and feet at new C, then arse no longer at new D, but somewhere between it and new C, and knees no longer at new B, but somewhere between it and new A, with segments angled more acutely, that is, head almost touching knees and feet almost touching arse. All that most clear. The entire tract is destabilized by what goes before and what comes after in this case, the phrase mathematically speaking, which suggests that there might be other ways of speaking about this body that do not encompass its geometrical positioning and size, although the text merely goes on to almost, although the text, sorry, goes on to almost entirely ignore that possibility. What is merely a question seems obtuse as the narrator decides upon the spatial parameters themselves and then struggles with them as if they are predetermined. Um, I'm just gonna show you my very good drawing of what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. It is unclear what the narrator is driving at with the obsessive repositioning and reshaping. Is the body struggling to fit to an undeclared standard? If so, where are the limits that it approaches or ought to approach? A difficult but not impossible satisfactory stasis is implied to exist. However, at this point, almost two thirds of the way through the short text, having already repeated several of these protracted, anxious, algebraic outpourings, it seems likely that the aim is either simply realized in its enactment or that it can never be realized. Realization becomes a purely conceptual notion that exists to encourage movement. In this way, the limit is simultaneously evoked and made nebulous. The repeated refrain of almost clear becomes ironic and amusing, a leitmotif that accumulates significance in the most Beckettian mode possible through divestiture of meaning rather than reassertion in new context. 
This prevailing use of code and mathematical terminology has a similar effect to that of a minimalist art piece. It asserts shape, scale, and space as equal to meaning. Following Alan Badger, Mark Botha examines minimalist art and literature using set theory. In set theory, rather than a linear conception of infinity, akin to a timeline, infinity is an infinite number of sets, each defined by their difference from that which groups them, namely a non-qualitative void. Thank you. This diagram is based on different ideas. Uh, zero is in a set by itself, therefore, zero is a set of one. Similarly, in terms of visualization, this theory introduces a void into serialization that is both more strikingly exterior and more strikingly integral to its object. Whereas linear infer infinity is defined by its abundance in relation to an absence that does not interfere with its increase, set theory infinity relies on absence ontologically. Botha states, therefore, that what minimalism in fact generates is an aesthetic field in which radical quantity and radical quality are coextensive. One might think of this as a demystification of the separation of form and content. The physicality and the conceptual and technical structures through which meaning is created are inseparable. This is the sense in which Beckett evokes the complete but partial object without creating paradox. As Botha states, quote, all entities exist with a singular intensity, while their being rem remains multiple. This has implications for the way that difference functions in Beckett's texts. Fragments in the text are not isolated postmodern cargo, jettisoned from a greater narrative of redemptive meaning. By imagining the void that surrounds them in the context of set theory, it is impossible to ignore the missing parts of the complete whole. In reframing the process of differentiation, Beckett's work breaks with a conception of meaning making that would aim for wholeness or define wholeness as meaning. His obfuscations do not seek a sublime, objectless transcendence. In purporting to do so and evincing the restrictions encountered, they force the definition of meaning to alter in quantity and in quality, in time and in situation simultaneously. Botha defines scale in an artwork as the quantity proper to an artwork in order for it to persist at a singular intensity. Botha may be referring here to a Deleuzian notion of intensity, which is, quote, difference, but this difference tends to deny or cancel itself out in extensity and underneath quality. This intensity is, therefore, naturally relational and ephemeral. It is slippery, dodging any qualities and existing impermanently, essentially between, in or underneath something. Scale, in all strange way, is tangential, touching on plasticity, but at the same time, constantly adjusting and altering its quantity. Sex becomes a parody of pornographic styles, a series of permutations in space. Quote, Fancy her being all kissed, licked, sucked, fucked, and so on by all that. No sound. Hands on knees to hold herself together. Till halt then up. No. No image. Down. To her down. The text implies that it is Emma who is speaking about herself in the third person, as the capitalized fancy is mid-sentence, suggesting a new narrative voice. From the initial scene of Emma in a room of four walls, all containing parts of a naked woman, we now have a naked woman curled up, imagining the walls doing these things to her. Immediately following this, the image is erased, quote, never was, and the focus is brought back to Emma's bodily positioning. The emphasis on her gender here, to her down, suggests a kind of erasure that isn't inflicted on Emma. After his sexual encounter, he returns to a position of rest, whereas Emma crouches down, and she remains the focus until the end of the text. The feminine here is marked out as leading towards lessening or deletion, but importantly, also not marked by its embodiment. Whereas the feminine is frequently presented as equal to the body or expressed through it, as contested by Mary Ann Doan in Film and the Masquerade, here the feminine critically has just as little proprioceptive mastery as the masculine. Likewise, the text viewed diachronically displays a Deleuzian intensity in the sense that it denies and cancels itself out. Quality does exist on some level, but it is clear that it, in its minimal drive to lessen, might easily be below that, in a fictive space that can be judged distantly as wrong and altered, but which maintains its status as space. Similarly, Emma is human and unproblematically without sex and with gender. This demonstrates the accommodation of antagonism that is integral to Freeman's concept of hybridity in queer time. This wrongness inherent to Beckett's work is what ties it to minimalist art practice. 
Minimalism that refuses to admit a relation of authenticity between artwork and reality is manifest in the work of Fred Sandbach, who says of his work, it is not illusionistic in the normal sense of the word. It doesn't refer away from itself to something that isn't present. Its illusions are simply present aspects of it. Sandbach was a minimalist sculptor working with thread, active from the late 1960s until his death in 2003. His work coincides with Beckett's not only in time, but also in its professions to cohesion, use of color, and minimizing tendencies. Gordon, Ho Gordon Hall notes, the focus on possibility and resistance that is staked in a minimalist conception of difference um, and identifies the potential that minimalist sculptures can teach us how to see bodies without demanding explanations of them, end quote. Minimalism then prioritizes the process of being with an artwork. It expects engagement at the same level as a Renaissance painting and can offer none of the depth of visual detail. Therefore, the viewer is left in the same position with less to contemplate. Put differently, the stretch of time is the same, but the theoretical content is depleted. The content of the artwork begins to converge with the process of time spent in front of it, foregrounding its scale and therefore the concept of difference prior to qualitative evaluation. One of his artworks. Um, with a physical artwork, the problem of language is at best secondary. However, in all strange way, this form-like imminence is created in language, Hence, Leo Bassani's comment that difficulty in reading Beckett is, quote, a function of mobility rather than of understanding. What does this mean in relation to a text on a page in a book? The process of reading becomes focused on moving through text as one moves through a minimalist installation without seeking to associate or escape the story world into a hermeneutics of suspicion, but rather towards a hermeneutics of susceptibility. In her essay, Sublimity, a word defined as a state of simultaneous boredom and astonishment often evoked by minimalism, Sian Nai addresses the stupefying effect of language that obstructs or refuses to elicit a response, as it, quote, raises the significant question of how we might respond to what we recognize as the different prior to its qualification or categorization, precisely by pointing to the limits of our ability to do so. It is this prior that is particularly interesting about Nai's theory of sublimity. In creating a negative differentiation, precisely in relation to its temporal realization, as well as in its lack of qualities, the reader sees both time and space as obstacles to essentialist definition, since the concatenation necessary for narrative is not available. This might assist with rereading aspects of Beckett that have foregrounded and assumed the masculine, somewhat in the same way that All Stranger Way first of all performs and then undercuts itself. When MO becomes Emma, it is this stuplime differentiation at work. Quote, no, no image, no fly here, no life or dying here but his, a speck of dirt. Or hers, since sex not seen so far. Say Emma standing, turning, sitting, kneeling, lying in dark and light. Just prior to when the change in gender assumption is made, the scene is subtracted from repeatedly. The fixation on the speck is figuratively erased and Emma's life is instead compared to the speck reducing and dehumanizing him. The regendering of Emo, Emma, though based on biological sex, epitomizes the centrality of queer analysis to this minimalist expression. Hall muses, quote, what would it be to allow a body to be silent, fully present, without telling us anything? This ambivalent regendering suggests a difference that has no quality but in its repetitious movements. This blankness is linked to the usually almost inexplicable drive onwards in Beckett's work. Interestingly, genitalia are always promised by the text by the repetition of details later, but are never shown. Another significant lacuna that necessitates not forwards but more, and a deconstruction of the body as signifier or prior of gender. Differentiation must exist in the text, but the assignation of value or quality is deferred as far as possible. This means that it must be ruled by scale, which requires that the bodies involved be in constant flux. This flux is echoed by the sexual aspects of the text, as Graham Fraser notes that, quote, abandonment of the sexual is not an abandonment of the pornographic. The narrator's real obsession is not erotic, but with the manipulation of human forms in, sp in space. Fraser's evocation of pornography, as opposed to eroticism, in order to refer to sex that is not suitably titillating, intimate, or heterosexual, creates a false dichotomy here. Beckett himself had trouble deciding on what was or was not pornographic, and it seems certain he had an interest, 
having read both Dessard and Aretino. In a letter to George Reavy in February 1938, Beckett writes of 120 days of Sodom, quote, the surface is of an unheard of obscenity and not one in 100 will find literature in the pornography or beneath the pornography, end quote. However, the following day to Thomas McGreevy, he writes of the same, nothing could be less pornographical. It fills me with a kind of metaphysical ecstasy, end quote. Fervid though both of these remarks are, they do betray a certain ambivalence towards what constitutes the pornographic. What is curious about these comments is that the pornographic aspect of Dessard is repeatedly figured as an outer layer or surface underneath which the literature resides. Pornography for Beckett is constructed as a mode of operation and a form of movement rather than a literary gen genre in and of itself. Yet in his work, this formalist structure of passing mode and literature or form and content is deconstructed. Perhaps this suggests that by 1975, Beckett had also done away with this idea. Diagram, the final, second, and only designated chapter of All Strange Away, stages a feminine monumentalism that delegitimizes the essentialist or absolute. It is worth quoting at length. That's it. It's another example of her poem back there. Uh, glare now on hands, most womanly, clear and womanly, especially right, still loosely clenched as before, but no longer on ground, since corrected pose, but now on outer of right knee, just where it swells to ball as before. All that most clear. The repetition of clear prior to womanly and its repetition in the refrain that occurs throughout the text, the somewhat baffling all that most clear, and the assignation of this, this section under its title diagram suggest an imperative for which the text strives. This is, as with all isomorphic specificity in Beckett's work, undercut. The use of mathematics in relation to the body in Beckett's late works has been read as a move away from the emotive. However, it is both the minimal and the mathematical that inform the emotive aspects of the work. What is inescapable here is the designation of the bodies in all strange way as bodies. The use of gender identity creates a mediator for this slippage. What can be said to be womanly about these hands? Of course, prior to this, there has been the reference to female gendered bodies or sections thereof as, quote, lovely beyond words. This humorous presentation of an inability, but what in fact amounts to a refusal to describe and furnish the gendered body, returns it to a level of abstraction that is at once tied to the body irretrievably and nonsensically multiplicitous. Gender here is ambivalent, without quality, but inexorably tied to a body, any body. This is akin to the emptiness of lovely. One is never told how, and therefore these descriptors become placeholders. They correspond to nice differences without concept. It is possible to imagine a multitude of interpretations for what a womanly hand might look like, but the inclusion of this as a descriptor in this mathematical economy makes it into a familiarizing tool. This familiar categorization reminds us to treat these bodies as bodies, not because they have an intrinsic transcendent humanity, but because language refuses to allow them not to be bodies, although they may be severely mutilated, ambiguous, and suffering. Gender has become a difference without a concept. To conclude, Beckett's use of, use of mathematics and geometric terms in all strange way serves to deconstruct primarily the concatenation of narrative, but secondly, the notion of gender as defined by a specific body. Leo Bassani's notion of moving through the text as if it were spatial rather than linguistic reveals the aspects of the work that have long associated it with minimalism. The movement's use of large installation works is exemplary, a staging of something ironically monumental in a visual economy that cannot admit of the detail or narrative structures that keep monumental hierarchies in place. By playing with spatial minimalism, all Strange Away, in reducing possibilities for movement, finds that the only possible way is language that, rather than functioning through oppositional difference, functions through scale. This is why binary gender can no longer exist in this paradigm. And similarly, why the narrative itself, if one can refer to it as such, advances in a nonlinear way. Rather than nihilist, Beckett's texts instead operate on a different temporospatial paradigm that makes nihilism or zero into a set of one. Thank you very much, Emily and Ellie, for wonderful papers that are inviting us to think about Beckett in genuinely new ways. I'd now like to invite questions to the speakers. <laughs>
It's a question for Emily. Thank you so much for your paper. Um, two things. Um, how intriguing that how she survived for your argument, isn't it? Because that really is the sentence that can be read in both from both perspectives. The, if you like, the almost neuronormative perspective, oh dear, you know, look at the constraints under which she operated and that's how she survived, or this is how she survived. Look, she survived, you know, <laughs> exclamation mark. So it seems to me that it's kind of already, the tension is already there in, in the text, isn't it? So we probably lazily went for one, in, you know, interpretation, but you're reminding us that there is also a s perhaps a slightly less intuitive that is also there. So that was, that was great. So that was just a comment. Um, my question is, what are the dangers in your larger project to use psychiatric discourse or to use a certain normative discourse as a term of comparison? Because of course, if you think about critical psychology nowadays, or if you think about even branch of psychiatry itself, or if you think about the anti-psychiatric movement, um, those definitions have been criticized quite harshly and they've been undergoing, for instance, a lot of Foucauldian, you know, um, critique. So I'm just trying to think about almost like, you know, an aspect of your research that was, pers was perhaps not quite foregrounded here. How can your work, in a way, perhaps put some pressure on those definitions? So that would be the question. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that question. I think it's really important um, that there's no assumption that, that using those kind of um, discourses are somehow the backdrop to everything, that that's the authority that I'm going back to. And I think I didn't really set that out in this paper because I think my focus was on Tom's interview. But um, I suppose for my larger project, I, I, use, I use theories from lots of different fields, psychology, psychiatry, anti-psychiatry, um, and Certainly, there's no privileging of any one of those um, those discourses or, or, or ways of conceptualizing mental illness or neurological conditions. But I think because such conditions and such concepts like mental illness are still so um, well, they're just they're, they're terms and concepts that constantly evolve. If we think about how much they've evolved, even in the last 50 years. So I think introducing a multiplicity of ways that Beckett's work corresponds with ways that are, we're thinking about it in scientific um, subjects is actually not saying this is what it is and this correlates with this neatly, but that, there is, that, that they speak to each other whether or not they are the ultimate truth about what these things are and what they mean. Hi, thank you both. I have a question really for Eleanor, um, which picks up on something, a sort of uh, observation you made fairly early on and didn't quite return to, you didn't need to, but I, it, it provoked a, a thought in me, which is that given you know, the extent to which Beckett's work is um, so full of um, uh, resistances to notions of um, heteronormative reproduction, um, why do you think it is that the field of Beckett studies you, you suggested not a field I know that well, um, has been, I think you said, resistant to queer theory? Um, it's, a, it's a difficult question to answer. I mean, it's not that um, there hasn't been any work done into it. Um, um, there's Peter Boxall's famous essay um, on Beckett and homosexuality, um, and Mary Bryden has written on gender um, really eloquently. Uh, I... <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure. To be honest, I think my answer is that I'm not entirely sure um, why, other than for the obvious um, problems with society in general. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is also for Eleanor, actually, and thanks for your paper. And such a, a it's always fascinated me as well that text and the switch over from emo to yeah. emo and so on. Um, I'm just wondering, how does it fit into your sort of paradigm 
there that Imo is still the actual one. So he's the one who's doing all the sucking, the whatever. But when it comes to Emma, mm -hmm. she's being done to. Mm -hmm. So there, 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 it's not a kind of equivalence. There's also a difference there. Um, so I just, I just wondered how that, how you address that. Yeah, I think um, the difference that I'm getting at is quite specifically to do with um, gender as it's related to embodiment. Um, I, I don't think I would try and make a claim that Beckett is trying to say that male and female are sort of on a level. I think it's more of a kind of ambivalence than, um, and it's definitely not a feminist taste, <laughs> obviously. Um, yeah, so I think it'd be, um, I think it's, it's both um, the focus on embodiment in relation to gender rather than the difference between the two genders that is presented in the text. And um, uh, oh I just lost my train of thought, that's terrible. Um, oh, secondly, just the presentation of the feminine um, in, in general as a, a slightly different um, way of, um, of from the normative, although obviously that's a problematic term to use as well. Um, <laughs> uh, no, yeah, a non-normative um, in inverted commas presentation of the feminine, um, as I've mentioned in my paper. <laughs> Um, am I the only one who picked this up, actually? But in that quote you had about the hand, it's the ball of the hand, isn't it? But at one point, the woman's hand is swelling to ball. I mean, isn't that quite interesting? It's it's almost a kind of... I think it's the, <laughs> the ball of the... Is that just the way the my elbow, mind works? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, definitely. I it's definitely it was really the strange imbuing of the hands with a sexual like, <laughs> excess. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I don't overburden you, Ellie, but. Uh, <laughs> Just another one. It's, I'm very interested at the very end when you um, mentioned uh, after the reduction to the minimal and you, you talked about nihilism. I think it's a really interesting thing in relation to Beckett's studies. It's, I'm sure it's, it's something we've all come across in relation to nihilism and Beckett. You know, how do you answer this? Which you know, we, we, we often do, but it's a, co it's a constant question that comes back to. And I think here possibly we have the beginnings of a, of a brilliant answer to it. Yeah. So could you talk a little bit more about how you think the reduction to the minimal, uh, which doesn't reach zero, which I, I really love that phrase at the end, how, do, how does that uh, engage with that space between uh, the real and the nihilist at the end, or the, the full and the nihilist at, nihilistic at the end? Yeah, I mean, I think, it's, um, I think it's something that people have been saying throughout this conference. I mean, um, with uh, the people just now on sound, um, this, this kind of constant slippage when you attempt to get to what is the essential, yeah. which is obviously also um, something that you can see reflected really clearly in gender, um, where there's a, s a constant slippage when you try to get to the core, or, or which could also be the nothing or the nihilist. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, which becomes, which is constantly undercut. So you never reach this, this nihilis nihilism that, um, seems to be being professed, but um, can so actually never be achieved. To, to uh, dredge down to my very basic knowledge of um, maths from a long time ago, is it like calculus where it, it goes towards the edge but never actually reaches the, the mm -hmm. point? Is it that type of um, I mean, I guess movement? it's just a different way of grouping numbers. I mean, um, yeah, so rather than having uh, a line where you can drop off at either end, um, uh, it's, it's more of a, a, a selection of groups so there's there's no sort of beginning and end necessarily, um, which I think is quite a quite a good way of mm. also thinking about the way that Beckett deals with um, the story world that he creates. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Yeah.